Very good afternoon, fellow Phoenix members and guests. This webinar is brought to you by Phoenix Ethics Committee. And to formally start the program, may I request everyone join me in the opening prayer to be followed by the singing of the national anthem. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to meet at today's event. May you extend your divine wisdom to our speakers so they may be able to impart their knowledge and expertise. Bless all the participants that they will obtain vital information from this event, that they will go out and share what they had learned. In the spirit of your love and generosity, may this activity glorify your name alone. Amen. Once again, uh, I am your MC for today. I am Ray Abelo and subcommittee chair of the Phoenix Ethics Committee. Now, before we formally start, I would like to inform everyone that this webinar is accredited for 1.5 CPD units. You will receive a certificate of attendance provided that first uh, you attend the webinar for the whole duration uh, of today's event. Second, uh, you accomplish the evaluation form at the end of the webinar. Third, open your cameras at all times. And last but not the least, be there during the picture taking towards the end of our program today. And so to officially open our session for today, may I now call on the Executive Vice President of Phoenix, Mr. Jose Luis Gomez, for his welcome remarks. Thank you, Ray. And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar entitled Ethics Chasing Technology. This webinar is made possible by the Phoenix Ethics Committee, headed by its industry's chair, Ms. Wilma Miranda, and equally active liaison director, Ms. Flor Tariela. <clears throat> Ethics plays a crucial role in shaping the landscape of social media as it guides the behavior and responsibilities of users, platforms, and organizations. In an environment information spreads rapidly and can have significant real-life consequences, ethical considerations help to ensure that the content shared is truthful, respectful, and does not promote misinformation. Social media platforms are responsible for moderating content to prevent harassment, hate speech, and the spread of false information, while upholding users' right to free expression. Additionally, ethics guidelines encourage transparency in data usage and privacy, fostering trust between users and platforms. Ultimately, a strong ethical framework in social media not only enhances users' experience, but also contributes to a healthier, more important society. To shed more light on ethical issues related to social media, we have invited Attorney Ed Saltupas, Senior Partner at Bukitata Africa, Kauton, and Saavedra. I trust that everyone will be able to relate to and enjoy today's session. Thank you and a pleasant day to all. 
Thank you very much, Joey. I know that uh, we are all excited to hear from our speaker today. So without further ado, may I now call on the liaison director of the Phoenix Ethics Committee, Ms. Lorenza Tariela, to introduce our speaker. Distinguished guests, fellow Phoenix members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our guest speaker in the Phoenix Ethics Committee webinar, Ethics Chasing Technology. Our guest speaker is a senior partner of Buresita Africa Cotton and Saavedra Law Firm, a top tier full service law firm in the country and he heads data privacy cybersecurity, ai initiatives and special projects he is a dual lawyer qualified to practice under the philippines and the new york bar he is a product of ateneo he got his masters of law in harvard and his doctorate degree with focus on business and constitutional law in ateneo his practice is quite extensive. He is legal advisor to Fortune 500 and NASDAQ listed companies and many of the impactful technology companies in Southeast Asia. He has the advantage of working in all three branches of government, in the executive, as OIC Undersecretary for Legal Affairs, Department of Public Works and Highways, also in the office of the president, as chief of staff of the chairman of the Philippine Truth Commission. In the legislative, Philippine Senate, with Senator Grace Po, and in the judiciary, as court attorney in the office of the Chief Justice, Supreme Court of the Philippines. Our guest speaker's experience is wide, varied, and deep. Let's now listen to our guest speaker, as he expounds on ethics chasing technology with focus on social media. Ladies and gentlemen, Attorney Edsel F. Tupas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like the uh, clapping uh, sound effects. Uh, it, it sounds real. So uh, thank you, Floor. Uh, thank you, Joey. Uh, also, Ray. Uh, also, uh, for coming with Wilma. And I really uh, look forward to our discussion. Let me share screen. Uh, hopefully, no issues here. Everyone can see if you can nod or thumbs up um, the screen that has uh, the title. Ethics Chasing Technology. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ray. So exciting, exciting time. So uh, uh, I am uh, attorney Edsel. You can just call me Edsel. Uh, I am very excited to uh, um, present to all of you today, uh, almost 100 participants. Um, this uh, deck, this presentation is customized and developed by my team and myself for, for Phoenix. So this is the very first time I'll be presenting uh, the content of this deck. Um, I also encourage uh, offline or uh, discussions dialogues outside of this presentation so that we keep uh, the dialogue moving forward and not just be confined to, you know, a couple of credits, uh, you know, a webinar for the afternoon. Um, this, this talk will be about 45 minutes, so it's a bit uh, uh, long. I, I'll try to modulate it so that it won't um, exceed so much. I believe we will have an open forum uh, as well after. Happy to entertain your questions as moderated. <clears throat> uh, I have about uh, 70 slides, so it's a lot of slides. So we will be slowing down and speeding up on select topics. So I really look forward to discussing, presenting some of these ideas about ethics and, and technology, uh, focusing on, on social media. Uh, just more about myself. I, I know that uh, there was an introduction earlier. So I'm a senior partner at uh, Goraseta Africa Cotton in Saavedra. I lead uh, data privacy, cybersecurity, and AI initiatives. 
I've been in a lot of places from government to the private sector. Uh, I graduated from Harvard Law School back in 2008. Uh, I, I had uh, received the award Data Privacy and Protection Lawyer of the Year in uh, 2023, uh, very lucky. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, my, my domain experience and expertise can be brought to bear and benefit uh, everyone here. Um, so yeah, just uh, going through some of this, uh, I belong to a law firm that is a tier one market leader on technology media telecommunications uh, through all ranking and rating agencies. So it's not just me, uh, you know, we have a number of lawyers who are working under me. I think we're about 50 plus lawyers now, uh, last I checked, uh, getting bigger as well. Uh, under my watch, there are about 20 technology lawyers. Uh, many of us are ISO certified. So I am actually, I carry ISO certification for 27001. That's the Information Security Management Systems. Number by lawyers, I help accredit for 27701. That's Privacy Information Management System. I am a holder of a Certified Information Privacy Manager certification from the International Association of Privacy Professionals, which is a, a gold standard. Uh, I have AI uh, credentials. I hold a postgraduate certification on data privacy and protection, uh, other courses as well. Um, so yeah, uh, for the for the topics today, all right, uh, the topics for this talk will be divided into roughly five sections. Um, uh, the first section is about uh, social media under the corporate lens. What does this mean? Uh, it's looking at social media and ethics from the vantage point of the company looking inward, meaning how to approach and regulate social media spaces within the company among officials and employees. So it's an inward corporate family uh, vantage point. The second vantage point under zero uh, section one also deals with social media spaces from the vantage point of the company looking outward. How does the company, how ought the company manage social media spaces in which uh, it is a thought leader or market leader or some sort of uh, participant within the larger community like the rest of the world. So it's an outward external looking uh, perspective. Uh, number two talks about uh, challenges, right? Uh, ethical. And when we speak of ethical, we normally implicate norms of accountability and transparency, normally accountability, and my favorite topic, of course, uh, legality, right? So many ethical questions may or may not implicate uh, legal and policy frameworks uh, about social media. Uh, number th which uh, goes to number three, uh, we'll talk about some of the relevant laws and frameworks that govern uh, social media ethics. Um, number four is cool because I'd like to, you know, sort of share some tools which you could use in your respective companies or your, you know, whether you're a C-suite or, uh, you know, a, a, an employee or whether you're a proprietor, you lead your company about building uh, uh, ethical and safe, uh, trusted frameworks for social media use. All right. Uh, interestingly, there are some regulations under no less than the Banco Central that regulate, you know, uh, Banco Central supervised financial entities on social media space. So it's something, something, um, something serious, actually, something a lot of people uh, never really thought of that the central bank actually seeks to regulate uh, social media use, right? Key takeaways at the end of the talk, right? So five uh, sections. So let's begin for the first. So let's talk about the social media under the corporate climate. Interesting facts, right? Uh, the Philippines is still the number one social media capital in the world. Um, and if you go abroad, you know, you talk to your friends, uh, you can feel it. You can you can sort of uh, feel that, wow, you know, I'm a Filipino. I Yeah, I, I tend to use social media, Facebook and other uh, apps uh, more than my friends and colleagues abroad. Right, you you could sort of uh, see that in terms of frequency of use, Facebook is still number one. Right, so four hundred eighty three uh, minutes, I believe, uh, per 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 year, uh, per month rather. This is this is a monthly this is a monthly uh, metric. Uh, but in terms of how long, you know, once you open the app, how long do we spend time over which app? It's TikTok, not not Facebook. So you be the judge, right? Is it how frequent? or how long do you spend over 
which app, and then you choose which one. Is it TikTok or, or, or Facebook? So interesting stuff. Uh, uses of social media among Filipinos, right? Uh, and we'll benchmark this with global averages. Uh, it appears that our greatest use for, for social media is to research on shopping, <laughs> shopping, right? So looking for potential purchases of services and products, right? And the next would be on following other people, influencers, and not just you know, not just recreational, but also following people who have who have expertise on, on topics which we, you know, professional purposes, topics which we feel we need to learn more about, right? So experts and influencers. Work related, probably correlated to the first one, right? Work related is 43.5%. Interesting. So uh we use social media for, for work related purposes. And and news, of course, news, news and and uh, other uh, updates, uh, and we'll benchmark it with global uh, averages. So we we do turn to social media above and beyond what what you know recreational, pure recreational use, right? Uh, as against the global standard. So we rank number one in terms of following influencers and experts. Uh, we rank highly in other other uh, uh, sort of categories. Okay, so. Corporate use of social media tend to revolve around these uh, these, these five or six um, purposes, right? Uh, these are unranked, uh, but uh, companies, institutions, uh, NGOs, uh, MSMEs tend to resort to, so to social media use to foster and create communities, uh, brand equity, you know, managing the digital footprint, um, hiring, right? Hiring. Uh, insights, market intelligence, gathering market intelligence, checking out, you know, like uh, company performance, uh, where I can, how I can optimize my investment for the next stock pick, uh, marketing as well, like, you know, looking for potential customers, and also like a general, like, a, you know, brainstorming, like, I want to go to social media to sort of uh, help myself brainstorm for new ideas for whatever it is that I, I, I wish to uh, create. Uh, information source, right? So social media is widely looked upon as an information source as opposed to traditional media, all right? So many of you who are into the risk uh, assessment or if you are a risk professional, uh, it's good as a risk uh, uh, standard, right? Uh, managing risk to diversity, to diversify the, the various information uh, in, in making an assessment of risk, right? So you want to diversify your sources of information, uh, perhaps to have more robust findings. So you look beyond traditional media, you look at social media. Uh, social media is looked upon by, uh, you know, analysts to monitor the market, uh, you know, share price uh, insights, uh, company performance. Uh, on the other side of the fence, regulators, right? Regulators and regulated entities look at social media as an information source to detect fraud, uh, market inefficiencies, uh, correct market behavior. I know for a fact that the BSP and the SEC have what we call social media, systematic uh, social media monitoring uh, in order to spot um, um, irregularities or non-conformities uh, for, for uh, compliance frameworks. Uh, okay, so networking, this is what we, we look, we highly associate social media platforms, you know, uh, as as something of a network tool. But but uh, today, uh, it's well beyond that, right? Maybe in the year 2010 and onward, we look at social media as networking. But now it's, uh, you know, social media is way beyond uh, mere networking. You know, we make purchases online. We, we study. We do our homework. You know, we, we converse. We... We hold meetings uh, through Facebook Messenger, so on and so forth. Mix of uh, professional and private life being fused, uh, but so, but still, uh, social media is still traditionally a networking tool. What's nice is uh, because uh, uh, the, because of the fact that um, social and social media platforms, you can get to know people even without personally meeting them, feeling safe and 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 feeling some sort of trust because you can get to see. Um, uh, that person's network, and you get to see all the people whom whom that person is affiliated with, and then you get to see, oh, okay, so we have some connections that I personally know with this person, and therefore it seems like, oh, okay, this person hangs out with this group of people, therefore I can sort of vicariously get to know that person. So it's a very effective networking tool, uh, minus any face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, and it's usually a precursor to offline uh, meetings. So uh, reputation builder. Right. So 
we've heard of brand equity. We've heard of managing one's digital footprint, both in the person level and also in the company level. Intriguingly, many Gen Z, so I'm not a Gen Zer, uh, but many Gen Zers uh, surveys show that they look upon their digital footprint and reputation as uh, with equal to or of greater importance than their physical or offline uh, reputation. So very, very important. Uh, some actually feel that uh, digital reputation uh, should be should be more important, right, uh, uh, than than once a physical or offline reputation. So interesting uh, data case study. So. Some of you back if if you if uh, you're into you know uh, equities and capital markets and stock trading right uh, this is a, a um uh, an interesting case about uh GameStop right so uh, Reddit is a micro blog or it's a blog site and uh, basically uh there's this subreddit uh called Wall Street Bets right so you go in there and then people like post right uh some anonymous some people who reveal their, your real information mostly anonymous. They talk about like stock picking, but it's generally a, a, a Reddit thread that talks about negative information, right? So uh, in this Reddit thread, uh, GameStop was, was one of the negative stocks, but because of uh, a buildup of community investors, and, and now we call them meme meme investors, right? So memes, you know, you post images and they're, they, they, they sort of uh, gained a critical mass uh, among these this uh, this Reddit community to keep buying GameStop stocks, right? And it was it was a it was a company that was not performing very well, all right. Um, and so much so that uh, the stock price skyrocketed from four dollars to as high as one hundred twenty dollars in a few days, right? Crazy stuff, right? And because traditional information would point to uh, you as a stockbroker or as a hedge fund manager to short the stock. Uh, uh, short sellers, the, all the short sellers lost a lot of money, and it, mostly the hedge fund, uh, the big hedge fund companies, uh, and and it, it was estimated that many hedge funds lost about twenty three billion dollars, right? So, uh, the hedge funds lobbied, and they convinced a number of online stock trading platforms like Robinhood to stop suspend trading of the GameStop uh, stock. Uh, then there was another social media backlash, right? It wasn't just on Reddit, but everywhere else, where many um, uh, uh, retail investors who were in favor of buying GameStop um, sort of protested. And it became some sort of a north-south divide, you know what I mean? Like meaning, meaning uh, you rich, big, powerful politicians controlling the small investors like us. Right, uh, uh, you know, you should, you should, uh, you should die. You know, you should uh, all this hate speech, right? And this <laughs> prompted a congressional uh, hearing and an SEC regulatory action, right? And and in the end, <laughs> uh, the SEC of the U.S. Uh, held that there was no malicious intent to manipulate the stock, right? So this is the power of social media, from communications uh, dialogues coming from small threads like Reddit going to Facebook and, and LinkedIn and, you know, cross-pollination of, of, um, of uh, dialogue, uh, of ideas through memes, you know, which are intuitive images, uh, which can affect uh, whole markets, right? Uh, another one which uh, sort of uh, uh, interesting, this little sentence by Elon Musk on Twitter, back then it was called Twitter, I'm considering taking that as a private report 20 funding security. That's it. That's all he posted. All right. Uh, uh, this created so much volatility in the markets that Tesla and, and Elon Musk were sued by some shareholders claiming that, you know, they lost a lot of money due to price fluctuation. Uh, and the SEC itself sued uh, Elon Musk for misleading investors through this tweet, right? And this is uh, Twitter. Uh, in the end, uh, there was a settlement, right? Um and usually in the States, like if you settle, that means that there's a strong case against you. You'd rather just uh, privately settle. And Musk and Tesla each pay 20 million, so a total of $40 million, $40 million to that shareholder group for quote unquote misleading investors. Interestingly, uh, a California jury uh, sort of uh, for using quick proxies, acquitted or, or cleared uh, Elon Musk uh, in this regard for, for not having, um, for not violating securities laws. 
right? And then he appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States, but the Supreme Court dismissed uh, the appeal uh, without without extended discussion. So that settlement still holds, right? So uh, just the same uh, damage has been done, and there was a suit, and then there was a settlement, and there was regulatory action for this this little tweet right here. So let's go to number two. Uh, that would uh, second part of our, our talk. Um, um, and that was, I think that was a good uh, pretext for, for issues and challenges in using social media. We've seen how great social media can be, you know, uh, from, you know, going to OLX, uh, going to, you know, like shopping for property or merchandise, for getting to know prospective hires, for employment scouting, uh, and, and just for recreational activities. Let's look at the issues that social media can bring about. And let's uh, let's put it especially under the context of uh, business and company considerations. Uh, some of the ethical questions that would arise would be, you know, am I am I sharing am I posting something that tends to be oversharing? You know, in, in, uh, you know, millennials and uh, Gen Zers would call it uh, TMI. Too much information, TMI. Too much information, right? Uh, is the information distorted, wrong, or inaccurate somehow? Uh, Miss Lee, will my post, even if true, have a big impact on other people? So these are just general uh, sort of uh, questions that go into ethics when people, you know, ask about ethical use of social media. Uh, five or six uh, challenges to show one on the screen. Um, generally, literature would point to about uh, five or six issues in overall social media use in the corporate setting. So privacy, data privacy and protection. Uh, ranks up there. Uh, disinformation, of course. Uh, I think all of us have some sort of a first-hand experience in, in false news. Uh, AI, okay, so that's a new player. Uh, AI is double-edged. We place it here as a challenge because of it being a double-edged sword. It's either good or bad or both. Uh, online harassment, right? Uh, cyber stalking, uh, doxing, so D-O-X-X-I-N-G, that means one is posting personal information about you without your consent, right? Uh, in, in, with the intent to harass or uh, make a malicious post about you. Online fraud, so social engineering, we get that every day, all these text messages, although that's outside, outside of social media, but I'm sure it happens as well in social media where, you know, uh, uh, fraudulent uh, or, or syndicated behavior would occur, you know, um, um, selling a product to you that doesn't exist, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, let's go let's go uh, more substantively with, with some of these uh, challenges. So data privacy uh, is something uh, uh, that is um, globally recognized uh, by all uh, legal frameworks, right? Uh, and, and some, it's some uh, jurisdictions like the Philippines will be recognized data privacy as a, a fundamental human right. Uh, this is because data it can be monetized, uh, has economic value. Um, the interesting thing about privacy is what we call the privacy paradox. Okay, So you and I, we are protective of our personal information, our identity. I don't want anyone stealing my identity. I don't want anyone swiping my credit card. I don't want anyone posing as an imposter uh, and using my credentials as him or her, right? So uh, none of us would want to be uh, a victim of identity fraud. Uh, and to do identity fraud, you need a lot of sensitive personal information so that you can use it to your malicious means, right? If you're a malicious actor. Now, the paradox of privacy goes something like this. So, because social media has so many benefits, so nice, right? We tend to share and compromise our data privacy, our privacy, our information. We tend to, let's say, overpost, you know, oh, who cares? You can, you know, I click, I click yes to all the ticker boxes that allow Facebook or the platform to use my data, you know, those ticker boxes and stuff. You use, use me, abuse me, whatever, so that I can partake of the benefits of this free platform, right? And then one day there's a breach, right? Like a personal data breach. Or like that. Let's say there was a, a hack, like my bank account was hacked, or my my identity was, was stolen. Maybe it's because of the fact that I've shared so much personal information on my LinkedIn and, and Facebook platform. And then that's the time when we complain a lot, 
right? It's like, oh my gosh, I'm a victim of, of cybersecurity, of these malicious actors. Oh, you know, woe is me. I'm so sad, right? I've been a victim. My, my back account was wiped out, right? But if you look in the beginning of the behavior, we were so prone to share so much information about ourselves in order to harness so much benefit from social networks uh, when, when in the first place, we were so liberal at it that caused uh, the cybersecurity incident or uh, identity theft uh, later on. So that's, that's what you call the privacy paradox. We love sharing information about ourselves, but then when push comes to shove, when there's, when we are victimized, we start, you know, blaming the rest of the world or governments, blaming ourselves maybe about so much information being used against us. Okay, so online harassment and malicious statements, these are some of the um, types of uh, online uh, uh, vexing from threat stalking, doxing, uh, rumors, and offensive comments. Now, we're not yet at the realm of legality, but there are a number of uh, uh, statutes, laws that punish uh, these acts, um, social media activity, and, and more on that later. Uh, certain concerns related to privacy, so we're still in data privacy. If you are a company, so this is on the side of uh, uh, the company using social media as a corporate initiative. So your company, uh, you are a digital app, you know, you're using social media to hire people, you're using social media to gather market intelligence so that your app will be able to come up with more optimal results, whatever your business model is, you know, your data scraping all, all, all through these websites. So it's important that uh, data subjects give their consent to you for you to use their information, all right? Uh, also hand in hand with consent is transparency. You need to be able to declare uh, before you use their data, data of data subjects, personal information data subjects, uh, that you will be using their data for particular purposes, right? So this is a common standard for data privacy law and anywhere around the world, from GDPR to the Philippines to China, US, right? Uh, but but there are a lot of sublime uses of information like uh, um, browser activity, right? The fact that you're clicking away, you're moving around websites, you know, from Lazada to Shopee to, you know, Facebook Marketplace, you're clicking all over the place, um, we have what we call web tracking activity and the cookie system or cookies uh, are a way for service and websites to collect um, browsing behavior from you in a way that could uh, identify you as a particular customer. And then once that data is harvested, um, third party advertisement or advertising agencies who use digital means will then target you uh, for 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 targeted advertisement. So all of that must be under a consent regime. All right. So uh, it still happens where you know uh, cookies are still being used without without ones being one being aware of it. Uh, there was a lack of consent, but I'd say that's becoming less and less prevalent. There are a lot of um, notices nowadays, but just the same. Uh, it's important that many of us, if you can would read the fine print on the cookie settings to see how much uh, online behavior can be tracked by these various websites in order to target you, right? So there was a, uh, <laughs> there was a uh, case where uh, a minor started receiving um, um, advertisements, targeted advertisements on baby products, right? And the parents saw that information the parents saw that information. Um, the reason why that minor was being targeted with baby products is because she in fact was pregnant and her online behavior, her behavior manifested that, you know, gave indications that she was, you know, get, getting re ready to rear a child, right? And then so suddenly you have like these advertisement campaigns targeting you with, with uh, baby products, right? So is that a violation of privacy, especially if it's viewed by other people whom, whom you, you know, you, you wouldn't want others to know about, right? So it's a traditional realm of privacy, but it seems that uh, uh, browsing behavior and um, online behavior can be used to track, uh, use as a proxy for your other characteristics and attributes, all right? 
cookies are personal information. Uh, cookies, if you're a company that is in the business of tracking online behavior, just make sure that you have you know, your, your adequate uh, privacy notices and user consent. This is uh, old school, but I like uh, presenting this uh, anyway about Cambridge Analytica. So we've heard about Cambridge Analytica, most of us at least. So Cambridge Analytica is a political intelligence firm. So what it does is it data scrapes everything about you in Facebook, all right? So all these Facebook users, um, uh, all information from their personal information to their, you know, all types of posts to behave, everything uh, was being shared by Facebook to Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica would then tr uh, crunch that data and provide what we call political profiles, right? And then the political profiles will be sold to uh, politicians or whoever's interested in using that into campaign material, right? So you know about, I think we we have an intuitive, by now we have an intuitive understanding of, of Facebook and, and other social media platforms as having algorithmic, um, uh, having an algorithm where your feed will match your preferences and perhaps even your worldview, right? So you you click on the Olympics, Carlos Yulo, right? The double gold, uh, you know, congratulations to him. And suddenly, later that day, everything you'll see on your feed will be about Carlos Yulo, right? So so that that is the algorithm of Facebook at work to the point that so much information to be um, um, harvested from you in order to be to accurately predict or or describe your own world view, all right. So just imagine that data being sold to somebody like Cam Cambridge Analytica, and then analyzed and sent to a political agency, who will then target you by making sure that your world view will making sure that their ads, their public ads will align with your worldview and start flooding you with Carlos Yulo memes and images that somehow support that candidate, okay? Supportive of that political campaign or candidate or platform. So all of that is AI generated, happens within minutes, no need for a lot of human intervention and can hit millions of people in, in a span of a few uh, minutes in a short amount of time. Right? So that's how the algorithm works with uh, Cambridge Analytica. Uh, another, uh, of course, uh, that was uh, Cambridge Analytica's banned and that was uh, illegal and we've taken steps uh, to correct that uh, market behavior. Another one was a little more benign, but it's still no less uh, serious, was, uh, you know, these uh, data scraping and screen scraping companies like uh, LA, LAIO and Leon that would um, scrape and uh, copy images of, of kids uh, without consent. And then um, basically creating a, a facial recognition database and then would sell um, the images of kids to, to the next buyer, whether it be in the black market or not, right? So you can already imagine uh, the, the ethical considerations for that. Um, and uh, what it does is it, it uses, I mean, this business model uses what we call the fair use doctrine and um, remains to be seen whether that can still be used as a safe harbor. But basically, if you have, uh, if you use data for research purposes, for benign purposes, academic purposes, for NGO purposes, or public, publicly benign purposes, uh, and then uh, 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 that would that would plausibly uh, bring you out of the uh, excuse me, bring you out of the. Um, a rule regarding um, uh, copyrighted material, right? So it's what we call what we call the fair use doctrine, right? And then so the NGO would use that and would train data and then turn around and sell that data to for commercial purposes. And then that company will then use that trained data, which is originally for research purposes, for their commercial purposes. And that's sort of a way to sort of uh, launder data, like money laundering, launder data so that what was initially okay under copyright laws uh, can sort of be transplanted for commercial purposes uh, purportedly without infringing uh, intellectual property. This is this area is still being debated, but that's the business model um, that's being used by many uh, uh, AI companies that that use uh, undergo web scraping. So this is um, another more blatant 
uh, disregard of, of images. So a US-based startup called Clearview, again, this is a, a famous case, uh, scraped uh, all sorts of um, images uh, in order to create a strong facial recognition database, uh, again, without people's consent, right? Using uh, Instagram and all these other um, uh, platforms, right? Um, and then uh, when, when, uh, when the facial recognition software, which is um, uh, an AI powered system, uh, was was fine tuned, right? Uh, it sold the system or sell, sold the access rights in a subscriber basis uh, to authoritarian governments, right? <laughs> so you can imagine how you can imagine how um, um, uh, profit for profiteering this kind of uh, activity was. Also sold to legitimate law enforcement. Yeah, and this is back then when police units. You know, only had you know states and countries only had like let's say a mugshot and maybe uh, basic biometrics like you know um, thumbprints, right? And then suddenly you sell them a strong facial recognition software. You know, these police uh, agencies, these these local governments would would lap it up. Would would definitely pay good money for for uh, a strong facial recognition uh, database, right? And over, I think this database had over something like three billion people. Right. So that's uh that's crazy. Okay, all right. So web scraping. So I talked about web scraping. Okay, you could be a victim of bad web scraping, or you could be the proponent, the one doing the web scraping. Is web scraping or screen scraping or data scraping necessarily unethical, illegal, or bad? No, no. So there are ethical practices, there are norms that apply to what we call ethical web scrapers and ethical site owners, right? Uh, so these are just generally transparency norms. So if you're an ethical web scraper, meaning you you harvest data online, then just make sure that you leave identification like a user agent string. It's just a fancy uh, way of saying uh, identification uh, of yourself. Uh, and then you scrape at a reasonable rate without tearing down the site, right? Uh, it's called the den denial of service attack if you web scrape at uh, unreasonable rates. Uh, ethical site owners, you know, websites can allow for web scraping. So, uh, and just as long as, you know, uh, scraping is reasonable, proportionate to the data, um, you don't necessarily block uh, these viewers from visiting your site just because they want information from you. Okay, so um, Philippines, uh, despite the, us being the strongest, you know, highest ranking social media user in the world, uh, many of us still uh, still hold uh, concerns, right, on social media use. Um, and uh, our concerns are generally a little higher than the global average about misuse, personal data misuse, and disinformation, right? So there's some of the data there. Now, uh, misinformation, fake news, uh, many of us are, I think, are well-versed about fake news. Reason why fake news uh, is propagated rapidly through social media is because uh, social media platforms are are double-edged uh, massive reach you know very easily accessible um no filter they don't we uh, social media flat platforms generally do not have what we call editorial supervision or editorial vetting right raw data so that's um uh, news can or content or false news can be can can, can propagate really quickly Echo chambers. So I, I talked about this earlier about Cambridge Analytica, right? So many, almost all successful social media platforms from TikTok to Facebook uh, uh, might, might be prone to generate a lot of echo chambers, all right? So echo chambers, uh, it's like imagine yourself in a room and you only hear yourself or the people who you hang around with. So all of you are just talking about the same a Korean pop idol, right? Or uh, actor and act, actress, artista. You're only talking about, that's all you hear, right? So it's like you, you just hear the same topic over and over again. And it encourages uh, what we call a, a, um, affirmation bias, right? Because you hear what you want to hear. You tend to agree with it. You tend to like it. You tend to, you, you are prone to believe in it because it aligns with your worldview, right? Even if it is false. So that is the echo chamber problem that many social media sites 
uh, do encourage. It's addicting. It's, uh, you know, you know, scientific uh, findings would show that uh, echo chambers can lead to dopamine boosts, right? So, and that is the ecosystem in which uh, uh, disinformation may, may find itself in. Um, also, lack of credibility. I mentioned about the lack of editorial oversight that many uh, social media platforms uh, do not have, or if they do, uh, the controls tend to be weak or tend to be inefficient, right? It's a constant struggle. Um, certain norms of misleading advertising practices can be applied in helping you check against uh, false advertisement and false false information. These are traditional norms, uh, not necessarily particular to social media. So uh, you will know if an advertisement is false, if there's false represent, outright lying, right? Phantom riches, you know, get rich quick in two or three days, triple your income, right? Social consensus, meaning everyone else is doing it, why not you? Uh, source credibility, well, this is a Fortune 500 initiative, therefore we are believable because we are affiliated with Fortune 500 initiatives, right? Um, artificial intelligence in social media is a double-edged sword. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence is like social media on steroids, all right? So content creation, uh, content moderation, target advertisement can happen much more quickly uh, than before owing to AI systems that power uh, many, many initiatives over social media. So chatbots, bots, you know, you'll have profiles being multiplied, especially during campaign, political campaign periods, where you'll have uh, profiles that are fake, but then if you read them, it's very difficult to see whether they're fake or not, acts like a real person, so to speak. There are a lot of risks in using AI systems, social media. So I'm not saying not to use so, uh, artificial intelligence, but if you use it, make, just make sure that you're aware of the risks uh, and potential harms that AI systems can bring to bear. So I, I bring about TikTok because uh, TikTok is a majority of TikTok's uh, activities are AI powered. Okay, it's highly efficient. Um, and this is actually showcasing something I think to be a good thing, right? So um, in TikTok, TikTok shop, so TikTok Shop is a new uh, product offering by TikTok where you, it's like an e-commerce um, um, initiative under TikTok where you can sell stuff, right? Uh, and to do that, uh, the vetting is AI powered and the vetting is strict. So for instance, if you're going to sell a product, you ought to upload at least five you know, high resolution, different vantage points of the product. Uh, if there's certain product categories that are regulated like you know, children's toys or for children, then the, the, the punch list, the, the KYB and the punch list for, for the documentary requirements for, for product um, uh, uh, accreditation is, is tougher to meet, right? And it's all AI powered, right? Let's go for, uh, let's discuss some of the relevant frameworks and laws on social media. So I encourage everyone to sort of um, hold your questions until the end of the talk. Uh, and then happy to you know discuss some of these uh, issues. So the first that comes to mind, the first law that comes to mind is the Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012. One of our earlier laws that punishes cyber libel. All right. So libel tradition and other traditional crimes under the revised penal code uh, can now be committed through online and ele electronic means. And if it's committed through electronic means, like, uh, you know, like online harassment, um, then, then you could use the Cybercrime Prevention Act. You turn to the Cyber, Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012. But interestingly, I was involved in the oral arguments uh, that <laughs> sought to declare parts of, the, of this law unconstitutional. We actually succeeded in, in declaring unconstitutional some of the provisions which are, I think, uh, inappropriate, right? But much of the law remains intact. Um, so yeah, so Cybercrime Prevention Act, uh, Safe Spaces Act is a relatively new uh, law. And what this law aims to do is to regulate and, and um, punish gender-based sexual harassment or gender-based harassment in public spaces. So there has to be at least a third or fourth person in the picture for it to be a public uh, thing. Uh, public spaces, you know, so schools, uh, companies, job, you know, work, workspaces, and online spaces. So online spaces are 
are more often uh, public spaces. Uh, Data Privacy Act of 2012. So this is uh, this uh, protects this act is is intended to protect uh, data privacy and sensitive personal information. Um, so the National Privacy Commission has um, published and you know continues to um, update and and publish um, um, uh, advisories warning the public to be careful of what to share in social media, right? Uh, especially if uh, you do not have the consent of of the of of people, uh, there are exceptions, but generally, you know, you know, the, the NPC is just trying to tell people to be more circumspect. Like, you know, you accidentally take a picture of license plate of the car, or you know, a, an SSS ID or someone's uh, tin, and it sort of just finds its way to the picture, right? Um, and, and to be to be a, what we call proportionate in terms of uh, disclosure of information. So this is, uh, I'll settle down here for a bit. So interestingly, the uh, for many of us here who are involved in companies that are BSFIs, right? So Banco Central uh, uh, Supervised Financial Institutions, BSFIs. Uh, these are banks, you know, digital wallets, world banks, uh, commercial banks, and so on and so forth, uh, insurance companies. Uh, um, under Section 150 of the MORB, uh, BSFIs are required <laughs> to adopt what we call uh, a risk management system for social media use. So we call it a social media risk management system, social media risk management framework. And the framework, uh, as many of us are familiar with, you know, uh, frameworks uh, should contain procedures, policies, and responsibilities uh, assigning uh, responsibilities and functions to people, a governance framework, right? Um, a content vetting process, right? Procedure for for disciplinary action for those who uh, for, for all things that deal with with the use of social media by the BSFI. All right. Um, and interesting. What's interesting here is that the MORB uh, underscores that even what traditionally belong to the private space, like personal, uh, personal uh, private space of a BSFI or office or employee can be regulated by, by the manual, all right? So because social media, this is a recognition of the fact that social media has collapsed traditional personal and professional boundaries, fusing them into one, one image or one imprint, uh, then, then the BSP uh, thought it wise to sort of include uh, regulation over uh, traditionally uh, defined private spaces. Um, so some of the features of the of of this section would be to um, um, regulate or provide for policies that that go into content uh, speaking authority, like who can post. Define, you know, so the, the bank or the BSFI should uh, issue policies that would define speaking authority, define what type of content could be posted, uh, define the meets and bounds of uh, social media use by employees. If in case the employees um, talk about the BSFI, then there should be a disclaimer if it's just for personal uh, personal um, capacity or official capacity, uh, so on and so forth, right? So the GDPR is uh, pervasive. Um, it's a European uh, legislation, but it affects uh, a lot of companies and even countries worldwide because uh, because of the fact that the uh, European uh, Union subjects are affected by um, uh, cross-border uh, data processing activities. So GDPR is no joke. So within the European Union space, if there's a violation of data protection, um, um, fines can go up to 4% of your gross uh, uh, annual turnover of the prior year. Um, case study is that uh, um, the, the European uh, supervisory authorities are are not hesitant to go against the biggest tech, right? Um, and to impose hundreds of millions of euros or if not even billions of euros uh, in the event of um, uh, breach or, or violations of its rules. Uh, this is a new law. 
Uh, but basically what it does, and I think the Philippines is trying to adopt something uh, similar, but basically what, what this law uh, does is transfer accountability, increase accountability of online platforms on content moderation, right? So content moderation, meaning you have posts by people, the platform will regulate your content. Take it down or sort of uh, de-emphasize it or vet it, otherwise vet it. So that's what you call content uh, moderation. And there are lots of reasons. Maybe it prohibits uh, terms of service or there's pornography or there's violence, you know, lewd behavior and things like that. So th that's what you call content moderation. Um, and uh, this, this law sort of um, tries to encourage uh, uh, social media platforms to, to um, uh, uh, ethically moderate uh, and not be, be discriminatory uh, and not be arbitrary in content moderation. So uh, AI, uh, so there is uh, uh, content moderation that is AI powered. Uh, this is just the fact that I wanted to show. Um, uh, TikTok is almost fully automated in terms of content moderation. So you, you're not speaking to people when your your post is taken down, or your video is taken down. Um, Twitter or X uh, prides itself in in saying that all content moderation is human supervised. So we'll see. We'll see if that's uh, effective in the long long term. Um, Part four of the talk, so we're almost done. This is the second to the last part of the talk and probably we can open it up for open form a little later. Uh, given the benefits, the double-edged sword aspect, the, the you know, the, the, the fact that the social media can cut both ways um, and given the risks that we've seen in social media that could affect, you know, uh, corporate assets, valuation, speculative behavior, um, uh, personal harm, right? Um, given all the costs and benefits, uh, the next question is, how do we build a framework, a trusted framework for our companies um, uh, so that we can have safe and ethical social media social media use? So this this is an important aspect that tends to of the talk that that I designed to synthesize much of the uh, ideas and content that went before this. Okay, so in developing, uh, the, the first thing one can think of is to document policies, norms, and guidelines, right? You document uh, your ethical uh, requirements, your ethical objectives. So it's uh, good to define, first of all, the boundaries between what is personal, what is professional or corporate, and what is public, right? What is public free for all, right? But then again, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that Many personal online behavior, the posts tend to merge the professional and the personal. So it's very difficult for many of us who are actively online to sort of um, make a clear black line between what is, you know, wearing my professional hat or wearing my personal hat. So it's something that social media has has caused. It's a new dynamic that that has been brought about by by social media these days, uh, defining your purpose, the, sorry, type of the freedom of speech, right? So uh, um, take note that companies, the private sector can regulate speech, all right? So freedom of speech, strictly speaking, is not applicable to the private sector. The right to free speech is a constitutional right that can be evoked against the government. All right. So if it's a government that is regulating speech, that's when you talk about free speech. But in the corporate setting, we talk about free speech in quote unquote with quotations. Right. It's more like a, we talk about we, this really refers to, let's say, freedom of or flexibility of of what to say, you know, workplace decorum, um, um, ethical conduct, etiquette and things like that. Right. Uh, but not necessarily free speech, but I, we'll still use it anyway. So it's a question of balancing. Um, an employee or an official's right to speak or privilege to speak versus corporate interests, right? So yes, corporations may restrict speech generally, including online speech, all right? The next question is, if you can regulate, if the company can regulate online speech, then it's really a question of how proportionate 
and reasonable that regulation can be, right? And the restriction should not violate other laws, right? So um, uh, let's say if you regulate, there are lots of examples here, very difficult. Uh, there are no hard and fast rules. Rather, there are standards that you have to think about, more like standards and criteria, right? Um, obviously, you cannot constrain um, uh, your employees to, uh, let's say if you, uh, lots of examples, right? So um, yes, you can prohibit employees from gossiping, from using, let's say, hate speech. But on the other hand, and this is a weird example, you cannot force them to use hate speech, right? So that would be violative of, of applicable law. Okay, so in, in going back here, in, in drawing out your purposes and objectives, um, uh, much literature would advise companies to simply borrow from existing uh, handbooks, uh, rules, and norms. Like let's say the norm against the revelation of company secrets. You just migrate that to your social media policy. The norm that you're not supposed to uh, infringe upon intellectual property, right? Um, the norm that you're not supposed to, you know, share confidential informa information, um, things like that. You can just sort of migrate that to to social media policy, and there you you'll have the beginnings and trappings of of uh, a working draft. Uh, you ought to also think of your scope of the policy. So again, distinguish between company affiliate posts and personal posts. You can regulate both. You can establish what is acceptable conduct or not. Um, some companies turn to what we call acceptable use policies, but strictly speaking, acceptable use policies go into the regulation of electronic devices, like your laptop, your iPhone, and then it kind of spills over to content like social media use, right? But still, uh, you know, that's just really a uh, play of words and titles. You can use acceptable use of uh, policies and build upon them and, and include uh, social media rules and procedures in your existing acceptable use policies. Uh, and coming up with your, I mentioned some of this, uh, coming up with uh, the purposes of your so social media policies, you can think in terms of law. You can th think in terms of easy prohibitions. Like, you know, you're in a, uh, SEC regulated company, can you do insider trading? You, you're not supposed to do insider trading and therefore you can migrate that norm to social media. Obviously you should not publish um, um, uh, sensitive uh, material information, right? Uh, on, 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 on online, if you can't do it uh, offline. Uh, data privacy and protection, respect the sensitive information of other people. You, obviously, if you cannot, uh, if you uh, if harassment and, and discrimination is prohibited in the workplace, then you can migrate the same uh, set of norms to online behavior and social media behavior. Um, uh, some of the best practices in coming up with social media policies and policies, by the way, under BSFIs, what you saw earlier under the MORB, uh, ought to form part of your overall social media risk management system or risk management framework, right? Uh, it's a best practice for policies to 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 call for a frequent uh, meeting of review boards, you know, multi-stakeholder committees, because social media technology rapidly evolves, especially with the advent of uh, generative AI. So multi-stakeholder, social media is a social techno concept. It involves both tech and social norms and thus uh, inherently multidisciplinary. Shouldn't just be your, you know, your privacy officer, your chief information officer, or your tech guy. Should be, you know, multi-stakeholder. Your business ops, your marketing, your HR should be there as well. Uh, always check against the applicability of international foreign law, because uh, gone are the days when we just simply think about Philippine law. So GDPR affects us. You know that now the recent passage of the EU AI Act that will affect, uh, will have definitely cross-border impact upon other countries. Right. Always check against the applicability of other laws. The, these other laws may not have a direct sanctioning effect against you, but it may directly apply to your clients who may be based abroad and therefore will affect you. So many of our BPOs, KPOs are always doing their, their best to be compliant with US and EU law and you know the, the laws of their target uh, markets.
Um, so case study, this is a good case that I just want to showcase this because uh, Dell uh, seems to, you know, appears that to me has a good uh, social media uh, policy. So you can check it out. Um, covers all essentials, not so long and biblical. Uh, essential covers all uh, essentials. Uh, it's action oriented. Uh, references, of course, makes references to existing codes of conduct and employment policies, right? Um, it talks about speaking authority. Who are those within Dell can speak about the company on social media? Uh, what uh, content areas upon which uh, Dell has zero tolerance uh, over? Uh, if Dell personnel uh, employees uh, go online and, and do not have speaking authority, then there are requirements for that person to place disclaimers Right. These are just my personal views, in my opinion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, those employees are, despite having no speaking authority, are all encouraged to speak and share about Dell's, you know, information products and services and so on and so forth. Right. So it's a, it's a good uh, case study to look at. Uh, cybersecurity hygiene. Why is cybersecurity important? Because social media uh, as a platform is uh, an electronic uh, vehicle. It, it is... Uh, it is a type of electronic uh, technology, right? Um, and thus, uh, uh, cybersecurity hygiene is key for maintenance of social media platforms, whether you're a user or uh, uh, other third party, like, like a user, like a personal user or a cor corporate um, user. Um, some of us maybe uh, in this talk might have been victimized by hacks, hacking incidents where you're, because of uh, possibly Poor social uh, hyper cybersecurity hygiene. Your social media account had been hacked. You know your your friends texting you. Uh, this doesn't seem to be you. You know you're sending like all these weird messages all over. Your emails are issuing like weird stuff, right? You know, send money to me. I'm in Nigeria. <laughs> you know, well, whatever. Uh, so cybersecurity is is really key. Uh, make sure that whenever you use Facebook, you have multi multi factor authentication turned on. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, if you're a company using social media platforms, make sure to always conduct vulnerability assessments, impact assessments. So five A's, these are uh, traditional norms uh, that apply to uh, ethical media, traditional media, which I think can be applied to social media. Uh, um, uh, many uh, controls that you could use uh, um, as a defense against social engineering, you know, false news, would pertain to what we call uh, media information literacy, right? It's basic. It's basically uh, a catchphrase for, or another way of saying strong critical thinking for online speech, right? So media information literacy uh, is one way for you to gain competencies and and skills that would enable you to, or your kids rather, to guard against. Um, you know, uh, false news, um, um, you know, uh, um, disinformation, uh, enable them to have critical uh, approach towards uh, online uh, content, right? So I, training reinforcements, your company could focus on, again, cybersecurity hygiene, uh, basic stuff, right? From password management, your strong passwords, uh, email security, make sure you're your emails are always uh, logged off and things like that. You know, you have uh, antivirus uh, browsing habits that go into ethics and, uh, you know, watching out for social engineering attacks, um, scams, so to speak. Um, key takeaways. So we're at the end of our talk. Thank you for um, sustaining your attention. The first thing I'd like to underscore uh, is that um, social media policies and procedures, if you're one to you know, uh, craft and prepare uh, systems, procedures. And if you're a BSFI uh, governed by the MORB, uh, where you're required by the BSP to, you know, come up with uh, what they call a social media risk management system and framework, uh, you don't have to think in terms of all or nothing, 100%, zero, zero, 100%. If you can come up with a working uh, framework, 50%, you know, 60%, that's good enough, then anyway, it will be a living document. It is a good pragmatic approach to elicit further internal stakeholder inputs 
and thus uh, uh, making your document more robust in time uh, through stakeholder uh, contribution and participation. A social media risk management system is something I discussed again uh, that's applicable to uh, regulated entities under the BSP, especially for BSF eyes. Right. Um, uh, data protection and privacy is also a good framework uh, that you could use in, uh, in coming up with um, um, norms that, uh, coming up with the ethics and norms for social media use. Uh, if you are a company that collects data uh, and one of your vehicles is social media, um, and you use social media to collect data, then uh, laws and norms would require you to be transparent about your data collection and the requirement about you getting consent from your various data subjects uh, whenever you use and collect their personal information. Um, so social media is a big thing, right? Um, massive amplifying effect uh, if you use it right. Uh, many companies, including my law firm, right? Companies use social media managers as part of uh, uh, marketing management and, and brand reputation, digital footprint management, right? So social media managers uh, can be part of your overall public relations uh, committee or department. Uh, so social media managers are not just, you know, like high school people or grade school, you know, you get your son or daughter to just post for, no, no, it's a, it's becoming to be like a science, a trade, right? With particular skills on domains uh, that sometimes require certification. So it's getting there. Uh, media information literacy is key for me, probably the most important for everyone to guard against uh, uh, misinformation and fake news. Um, and on the supply side, so let your supplier of social media content, um, MIL or media information literacy is also important if you're on the supply side when you broadcast uh, content uh, so that you will know what can be trustworthy content to post and share as opposed to uh, illegit or untrustworthy or illicit content. Right. Uh, some laws here uh, tend to have a, a, a comprehensive effect on social media. So cybercrime, Prevention Act, the Safe Spaces Act, the Data Privacy Act. Um, abroad, I mentioned earlier to take note of GDPR and the EU AI Act. Um, foster trust and public confidence. So uh, again, uh, social media is there to, uh, supposedly as a tool, right? Um, but I think we ought to think of social media not just a tool, but uh, a creature. It's there to stay. It will affect you whether you like it or not. Uh, so the question next question there is not to prohibit it, not to ban it, but how to convert it into ethical uh, communities, to come, how to come up with effective uh, trusted frameworks that can be brought to bear for various stakeholders and communities within the company, within our respective institutions, within and also external facing interactions with our customers and clients and potential uh, stakeholders and customers. So that is it. I've gone a little bit over time. Happy to pass the mic back to everyone, uh, to the moderator or to the to the host. Uh, thank you very, thank you so much. You can reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn, on social media. Happy to discuss uh, things, uh, anything, everything. Um, also reach out to me via email if you have any questions. Uh, back to you, uh, Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney Edsel. And indeed, it was a very insightful presentation on the double-edged nature of social media. And I, I must say, very practical and helpful sharing as well on how we could uh, develop the social media uh, policy for our companies that we work in. Now, at this point, I would like to call our reactor to share her perspectives about the topic. She is the managing partner of Forbes Mazars Philippines. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Jacqueline Villar. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ray, for the kind introduction. A very pleasant afternoon to our speaker, Attorney Edsel Tupas, and to all Phoenix officers and members with us today. Attorney Edsel's discussion on social media ethics comprehensively covered the impact, scope, and potential solutions 
to address challenges that individuals and companies face when it comes to managing social media and ethics. As a social media user, I appreciate Attorney Edsel's slide on ethical questions in social media use, particularly on asking ourselves the question, what impact will this post have on others? It's essentially think before posting, as they say. To add, I would like to emphasize that we should remember to think not only before posting, but in also commenting, sharing stories, following other pages, or even private messaging. These formats may have the same impact no matter how much we adjust our privacy settings. While we can control our own content, we cannot control the screen grabs or recordings of others. Once it's out there, there is no taking it back. I know um, Attorney Edsel already shared some cases, but I would like to uh, share this interesting landmark case back in 2014 ruled by the Supreme Court. It's a case involved, it's a case filed against St. Teresa's College. It is the first ruling made that explicitly deal with privacy in social media, specifically privacy in Facebook. It sets the parameters as to what is considered private and public in social media, wherein the Supreme Court held that nothing is ever private on Facebook. The decision stemmed actually from the case involving photos posted on Facebook of two minor students from STC. The photos which were uploaded by one of their friends showed the students drinking and smoking in a bar and wearing just undergarments in a street. The photos were shown by one of the Facebook friends of the girls to the school officials, prompting them to ban these students from marching in their graduation rights in March 2012. According to the STC, the students violated the school code of conduct. Thus, the parents of the students in defense filed a petition for the issuance of a writ of habeas data and asked the court to order STC to surrender and deposit all soft and printed copies of the photographs and to declare they have been illegally obtained in violation of the children's right to privacy. However, the court dismissed the parents' petition and ruled that STC did not violate the minors' privacy rights. So another interesting comment here are part of the decision of the Supreme Court, they said that to be good digital citizens, self-regulation is the best means of avoiding privacy rights violations. As a business leader, Attorney Edsel's emphasis on data protection and privacy, misinformation, use of AI, harassment, and fraud as key challenges considered are indeed highly relevant. To relate to this topic, for our company's awareness campaigns, we have mandated regular trainings at a local and global level for all our employees covering these topics. As technology evolves, so do our training and guidelines. So these trainings are hosted in a learning management system for self-paced learning and seamless verification of completion of each employee. This regular awareness training for our employees is our safeguard against potentially expensive incidents affecting our brand reputation. I also echo attorneys, attorney Edsel's recommendation for a risk management system covering governance, policies, monitoring, and even crisis management. For crisis communications, our employees are advised to refer to official statements for their information and direct media inquiries 
to de designated spokespersons only. On monitoring, our brand team utilizes social listening tools to detect whether the mentions of our brand online are either of positive or negative sentiments. As people tend to air out their frustrations online, we also encourage our employees to direct their concerns in meaningful platforms internally so that we may address this more quickly and efficiently. Our online whistleblowing form and regular employee survey provide employees with a safe platform to report concerns to be received by our counterparts in other countries. So while social media offers many benefits to individuals and businesses by connecting them with their stakeholders, it amplifies the risk of compliance and reputational costs. This gives us more reason to do things right and keep our employees informed. As we find the balance between communication, innovation, and ethical conduct, we can harness the power of technology for the benefit, for the benefit of all our stakeholders. Social media is a powerful tool, so, but as the popular line goes, goes with great power comes great responsibility. So thank you again, Phoenix, for this opportunity to be part of this interesting session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving to our open forum. So I would like to call back Attorney Edsel and Miss Jackie uh, to be part of our open forum, which is going to be moderated by the managing partner of Inventor, Miranda Associates, and concurrently the chairperson of the Ethics Committee of Phoenix, Ms. Wilma Miranda. Wilma, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ray. The presentation of Attorney Edsel Tupas this afternoon was not only enlightening, thought-provoking, comprehensive, but it stirs up a hornet's nest because for a long time, we had taken for granted the ethical concerns in social media. Universal Macan in 2020 considered the Philippines a stop in social network, uh, networking in the whole world because 83% of Filipinos use social media. And this was further validated today in the presentation of attorney Edsel when he showed us the graph and the statistics that the Philippines has been at the top ranks in all categories, especially in the category of following influencers and specialists where we rank number one at 43.9% vis-a-vis the worldwide users of 22.6%. And that's quite a big percentage. That's why our ethics committee in Phoenix pulled this webinar as a channel for us to be able to create awareness. There seems to be a lot of cyber hacking, cyber criminals, harassment, which is really a conundrum in our Filipino society today. Now, to, to start the ball rolling, I would like to ask the first question. Of, of course, there were also questions in the chat box. But I would like to ask the first question. In the presentation you had a while ago, Attorney Edsel, you showed us that Facebook and TikTok has the top, are the top platform applications when it comes to social media. And there was also a statistics by bigvillage.com that Facebook, TikTok is the most unethical application, while Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube are the more ethical application. So uh, do you think this is right? And do you know the reason why? Your thoughts about this? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Facebook is an early, it's an early uh, adopter and market leader. So it probably would be understandable 
that it has the most um it is re it receives the most uh allegations or accusations of unethical uh content management right um uh, but facebook is i'm not here to defend them uh, they're not a client of the firm but uh facebook has evolved uh from what it was in 0506 to 2024 a tremendous uh leaps and bounds so there's what we call a, a board that is a multi-stakeholder board that uh it acts like an appeals committee it's uh it's an ngo i, I forgot it, the name escapes me but the uh, experts populate this uh board this appeals board and every time there's an issue uh which uh facebook uh tries to uh dispose of versus another interest like a user or other other stakeholder uh and yet uh, the parties still remain aggrieved then they appeal to this body and this body will will not only decide but also provide for guidelines and decisions and it's a it's an independent body uh i actually have some colleagues who who work at that and it's an in international independent body because well i mean facebook can make or break countries uh, it can make or break campaigns uh, companies of course and people uh, so I wouldn't be surprised that there is a lot of dirt that goes against the social media platforms. But again, it, I guess it depends who you, who you talk to as well. Um, uh, I think it remains to be seen how, how these platforms will continue to be more ethical, right? More responsible and, uh, you know, more, more developed in terms of uh, content uh, curation and management. Back to you. Okay. Um, this is also a follow-up to the question I have right now. You have presented a while ago that um, other other applications had rule-breaking content, which are automated. Yep. But uh, the ones which are manually intervened is LinkedIn and YouTube. Do you think this is also it's one cool. of the reasons why, you know, manual, manual intervention is better than the one which is being automated? You know, it's funny because... Uh... The EU AI Act prohibits against 100% AI content management, right? AI powered, right? So it's just like I don't know why TikTok is saying that they yeah, were 100% AI, which is which is which is not supposed to happen, right? So there, uh, AI modulation or modulated uh, content ought to be. There's a principle there that ought to be always subject to human supervision. I think it's a mix, right? I think it's a good mix. It, there are also other factors like uh, how well is your uh, AI filter trained? How good the algorithm is? I mean, if it if it sucks, then there's no amount of you know no amount of um, AI poweredness would would do would benefit your company. If it's inefficient, then might as well use human human supervisors, right? So it's really a question of um, um, the design of the AI and also the how well designed human supervision can be. Remember Twitter or X and Facebook are billions of users, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, it's difficult to scale. You really need AI somehow to scale up uh decision makers, moral ethical judges, so to speak, who you know and, and there are only a few hundred of them uh, at any given time. Uh, so definitely AI is there to stay, but I don't think uh, AI should be 100%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's a question here from our chat group um, that the question is why there are still so many cyber criminals uh, proliferating yeah. our social media. Yeah. Um, can't the NBI or police do something about it? And I also have, in relation to that question, I also have a question because in one webinar, which we had before, they say, you are a lawyer. So they say there is a cyber libel, a possible cyber libel in the social media. You don't need to go to court. There's no court proceedings needed anymore. All you have to do is to take screenshots and then bring it to the NBI to apprehend the culprit. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, so first question, right? Uh, about the uh, overall state of cybersecurity. So unfortunately, the Philippines ranks low in terms of um, uh, the number and level of domain expertise of um, uh, cybersecurity and information security practitioners. Even among the cybersecurity professionals, they'll admit that. Like they, we need more professionals who, who, can, who can 
teach, who can train, who can work for companies in order to develop uh, better cybersecurity practices, right? Uh, also, it's a question of, I think to me, uh, media information literacy. So that's why we're so prone to scams in social engineering being tricked because the malicious actor is so much better than the average one, right? Uh, and the the chasm, the, the gap is getting farther and farther, right? So uh, the in other words, the black market, what we call the black hat market is is rapidly evolving, getting even more developed than the formal sector, right? That is a that is partially a market dynamic. So the question is, will we smarten up? Will we hire experts from abroad? Will we have information transfer, technology transfer, and things like that, right? But the the need is there to beef up uh, cybersecurity and media information literacy. If you ask me, it boils down to media information literacy, grade school. Right, knowing how to use the iPad, knowing how to what, what does it mean to have strong passwords? What what does it mean? What what how do you detect bots and automated uh profiles that try to scam you as opposed to someone who's genuine? Those are basic skills that ought to be taught at the depth ed level. And then that can foster a better hygienic workplace, you know, things like that it'll massive spillover effect. Uh, mm -hmm. so there are scams, yes. And if we were going now to the second question, right? Like there's so many scams and then what's my remedy? I'll, I'll, I'm a lawyer, but I'll be very frank. If you are looking to legal remedies, you're too late, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, if your information, for instance, there's a personal information breach, your passport details, your bank information, uh, account, username, passwords, everything, all your apps, right, mm -hmm. are, are leaked. Uh, they're being sold on what we call the dark web, right? Mm -hmm. It is so difficult to take down information on the dark web. So that's just the black market. It's unseen, right? The moment it's there, it's like, wow, you know, you, you're, you're, you're good luck. It's like, it's so difficult. You can't apply for a temporary restraining order. You can't, it, you know what I mean? And who are you going to look for? Who's the cyber criminal? They're anonymous. Right? It's so difficult, right? So, I, I think, but that doesn't mean that legal or the law profession is outmoded. There are lots of proactive ways how to be, um, you know, when you think of, start thinking of legal norms uh, to help you in a proactive fashion. And there are also ways to use the legal system in a very proactive way so that uh, uh, much of the evils and negative impact can be prevented or mitigated. But in terms of criminal, yeah, you know, you get a cyber, it's, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. Think of compliance. You know, many, many of uh, us here are compliance professionals, risk professionals. There's a lot of like disclosures, you know, policies. A lot of that is law. A lot of that is like due diligence. You know, I think we ought to invest in the control level. Like if you, you start using ISO standards, you start using, you know, being aware of, you know, uh, physical organizational people controls, you know, uh, and training and awareness reinforcement that does a lot. Uh, so yeah, back to you, back to you. Yeah, thanks for uh, Miss Jackie. Uh, the uh, you had uh, it was impressive that you have your own policies on cyber on social media use and the use of social media, mm -hmm. but being um. A Masars Philippines member of the whole group of Masars International. So, do you have a unified uh, code of conduct or different uh, for different countries? Like, do you cover also EU or US, or is just an Asian code of conduct? No. Oh yes, thank you, Miss Milma. It's we have a global code of conduct, so we're following that, and we have. Yeah, it applies to all. This is a global code of conduct. We all it's also being managed through um soft face learning system. Uh we take it online. So we have a learning platform for that. Sometimes it takes like an hour or two hours for those kind of it's a series. It counts mm -hmm. in a series. But definitely answering your question, we are following a global code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And uh, attorney Edsel also mentioned about data privacy acts in California. I understand, for instance, in the United States, for different states, there are different rules, regulations on data privacy. So with regards to the Mazars, uh, you have different data regulations for different states. 
and I, I think Attorney Ansel, can, can I ask you first? There is a different data privacy regulations for New York, for instance, for California. So in every state in the United States, there is no one unified data privacy regulations. Each state has a different one. That Sorry. is correct. Yeah, that, that is correct. Sorry, it's my uh, technical issue. So so uh, I wouldn't, this is a, uh, this is an edgy comment. I wouldn't turn to the U.S. for for adoption of best practices for data privacy. Mm -hmm. I would turn to the European Union. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason is that all the big violators are in the states, right? So all the all the big tech that's being fined and subject to sanctions by all these regulators all over the place, including home home state regulators are in the US, right? And so there's such accusations as, you know, such as regulatory capture, you know, monopolies and things like that, market power. I mean, come, come on, yeah. Open AI, chat GPT, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, all, you name it, they're all Instagram, right? right? The only one that's not there is TikTok, right? But everyone is in the States. And so, you know, you could imagine how difficult it is for federal level uh, rulemaking and agencies to, to come up with uh, strong enforcement and strong policies. Some of the states are very good. They're very progressive. The most advanced is uh, the California Data Protection Authority. In terms of yeah. policies, circulars, anything, you know, children's rights, they're the most advanced. So always look to them. If you want to get ideas, fresh ideas, they're very fast. Why? It's because Silicon Valley is there, right? So very fast. But in terms of enforcement, all U.S. state uh, data protection agencies suffer in enforcement issues. You think you think many Philippine regulators suffer from inefficiencies in enforcement. Oh, the US also suffers from, from a lot of uh, friction and uh, you know lack of uh, resource constraints and things like that, right? So it's not just uh, the Philippines, but yeah. uh, in terms of norm borrowing, uh, California would be good. But in terms of overall learning, uh, GDPR is still the leader uh, globally you. and it- Yeah. Okay, that's that's for having a, a, a the best practices or having a standard, but Jackie, if we have a client in different kind of this in different kinds or in different uh, location in the United States, I think you also have to adopt the data privacy for each states, right? Exactly. In your privacy uh, regulations in the company. Yes. Yes. Uh, following the US and especially the GDPR, mm -hmm. uh, because it's really, I would say, very strict. No? They even have a very high penalty clause. So, I mean, compared to Philippines, that's why for us, we have to follow more on the inter what's available in the with these international countries because these are more stable and really more structured. It's really more cost costly, actually, for, for us. Unlike here in the Philippines, I think we're still somehow adjusting to this um. It's not as it's the implementation here maybe is not as strong as it is in other countries. Mm -hmm. so, if I may, uh, Wilma, yeah. I, I, I have a I have a potential solution. So, uh, our firm we use ISO twenty seven seven zero one, right? So seven of our about ten of our lawyers are ISO certified. Mm -hmm. I suggest to use a strong standard that captures. It's called um, compliance leverage, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term. You go for the strictest standard. And then kind of, in a sense, hope that the other countries sort of follow that standard, right? And behaviorally, it's true. So if you do follow GDPR, and if you combine it with a strict standard like ISO 27701 or 2729000 series as well, mm -hmm. uh, you will likely uh, hit all the major food groups. And then when you're, if you have an Excel sheet, a spreadsheet, that's when you can sort of consult uh, local council, you know, Singapore, Japan, are you compliant there? You can look for the outliers and spend minimal resources and just looking for the outliers. Spending majority of your resources and attention on the big stuff like GDPR and ISO 27001. That's it for me. Okay. Um, there's another question here. It's about cookies, deleting cookies. I'm sure that we all met, you know, when we receive, uh, we go to a site, there is accept all cookies, delete all cookies, or select cookies. So uh, how do we deal with cookies? This is a question from the chat group. We, we, cannot, we can delete all cookies and yet be able to access the site. We've already experienced that. When there is a, a question about accepting all cookies or deleting all cookies or, or uh, not accepting all the cookies. I was still able to access the site, right? 
Yeah, that's a really good question, uh, Wilma. Um, the answer still depends uh, because uh, and also a question of what sites you visit. Mm -hmm. uh, some sites are, you can imagine, they're not very reputable. And so it doesn't matter what they state on the cookie settings, they'll still steal your information and you know sell your information elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it really still depends. However, as an overall posture, if you're the type who would not mind being tracked by third-party advertisement because it makes your life easier, right? Like you, you, you look for baby products and so you want the supply chain to come to you instead of you busy, you know, searching and stuff like that. And then you get targeted advertisement for baby products or whatever it is, shoes or bags or whatever, you know, like uh, food. So if you're the type who want, who's willing to trade off some privacy for convenience, then accept all cookies, accept all cookies, right? None of us will read the terms and conditions. Yeah. They're just too right. long. Yeah. It's called because consent fatigue. The, accept all cookies. Anyway, I'm just excited to go to the site. But now I'm more <laughs> careful about it. Although, if I may, I, I'll end. I'll pass the mic elsewhere. If you ask me, I generally do not anymore accept cookies. Because for me, it's easy for me nowadays to look for products that I want. Mm -hmm. right? Because everything is AI powered. Like Everything will sort of fit with me. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of having the supply supply side reach out to me through third party targeted advertisement, I don't need any any of that anymore, right? right. So I just uh, reject cookies. Mm -hmm. Customer preference. Yeah. With regards to cookies, I think there is a question here in the chat group about uh, I mean, with regards to AI, can AI be fully trusted in due time? Can this really be a complete and perfect replacement for human process manual processing in due time? I think this is also with regards to the social media. Let's link this, connect this to social media. So how can AI oh, yeah. safeguard what into our ethical standards? So if yeah, this, yeah, um, yeah. this uh, monitoring can be made by an AI in social media, are we more secure and are we more safe? Yeah, so if I, if I may uh, answer that, right. Uh, uh, the first hit sector, tech sector uh, in the AI, generative AI wave in the fourth quarter 2022 due to open AI such as GP was social media, right? Because of content generation, you create videos, you get images, you can take text, right? You can take, you can create balance sheets, you know? So my, my wife was creating balance sheets through Gen, through, through ChatGPT and they're fairly accurate, uh, I hope, I hope, no. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fear, that AI will, will, you know, you have uh, Terminator movies, right, they'll take over, is I think to me a far-flung fear. Uh, we do not have robust, uh, uh, what we call generalized AI systems, where across the board, all human domains, all types of uh, mental uh, activities can be done by AI. Uh, rather, we have, today we have specialized AI tasks. So think of, you know, specified tasks and you have AI systems that exceed any human human computing power for specialized tasks. So we have what we call specialized AI tasks. That's where the investment is. But if you want to be a little academic about it, until we pre prevail and uh, uh, popularize what we call a quantum computing, then, then until we have computing resources, then generalized uh, AI activities will, will, will not occur. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't think we have enough time, but there is a last question here, which uh, are from our group. Um, okay. This, there's, this, this is about web scraping and web crawling. Uh, I know about the definition here and the difference, but for the benefit of our participants here, can you specifically uh, differentiate web scrolling from web scraping? Yeah, so a uh, web scrolling versus scraping. Yeah, right. web 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 crawling versus web. Oh, web crawling. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So web crawling is really simply just analyzing. So scraping is deeper. Uh, mm -hmm. web crawling is simply just reading and reading and reading, viewing uh, data, and then getting uh downloading data that that it needs. You know, for purpose of your uh, business purpose, your application, your specific purposes. So it's sort of like. Uh, a bot or an application just going around online and sort of just uh, analyzing and reading stuff, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Choose uh, top 10% website developers, give me the profiles, and then I will hire them. So that's kind of like uh, 
uh, a web crawling uh, attribute. Web scraping is wholesale uh, data extraction. It's going into your site and basically taking all the data, scraping all the data, in all sorts of files, all sorts of file formats, image, text-based, even sometimes the, the code, right? So uh, there, the scraping has become prevalent, uh, dangerous also. So uh, you can imagine that um, certain ethical practices, data privacy and protection uh, rules have been applied against uh, uh, raw data scraping practices, uh, which before was a little edgy and illegal, right? Uh, without your, especially without your consent, like just taking your images without your consent, creating so you know facial recognition databases without your consent, without your knowing, and selling it off to people, monetizing you know your 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 your, your biometrics, so mm -hmm. that uh, enforcement agencies and countries can, can be able to use them against for general purposes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I just want to um to accommodate these two questions. The first one is in case an FB application was installed in a company. PC by the employee despite the policy's restriction, can management use whatever data from the social media as evidence against the employee? Who owns the data anyway? Is it the company who owns the computer or is it the, the employee who owns the computer? Excellent question. Super question. That's always this pervasive question. So that's uh thankfully it's a little legal, which is good. So you have to ask whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy given the context, right? So if uh, it, it's case to case, so there's no easy answer. So if there are, for instance, no policies, no manual, then the employee might bring his phone, it's his phone, and then start using it for company purposes. You can imagine that the expectation of privacy over his own phone uh, is very high, mm -hmm. and thus it ought to be protected. So the courts will use this uh, standard of reasonable expectation of privacy. On the other hand, Right, if the the expectation of privacy is low because it's a company issued device, there are policies and manuals which the employee signed off on. You know, made to read it as a condition for employment, things like that. Reason of expectation of privacy is low, and therefore you can imagine the company will have unfettered access to everything, anything in order to police uh, what is personal and private, police uh, appropriate content, but. Is it correct to say that the company will own that data? So under GDPR standards, you never own data. Data, personal information, sorry, personal information. Personal information is always owned by the data subject. Never waivable, always owned by me. But the question is, can you process my personal information which I own? That remains to be seen depending on expectations of privacy, policies, and consent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Ed Sell and uh, Ms. Jackie for that very engaging responses on the questions that we have this afternoon. There are still more questions, but we don't have time anymore. So I'd like to call back on our MC this afternoon, Mary Abdo, for the rest of the proceedings of the program. Thank you. Thank you very much as well, Yuma. And thank you, Attorney Ed Sell and, and Jackie. What a great exchange and uh, conversation during the open forum. Now, on the behalf of the Ethics Committee, we would like to present a token and certificate of appreciation to both Attorney Edsel and Jackie. And we call on also our license director and EVP to, to join me in presenting this certificate of appreciation and token. Mr. Joey Gomez and license director of Lord Tariella. Okay, so can you read? So this is a token family under a tree art plate by Amor Sodo. I'm right. And then uh, can we read the certificate of appreciation? So Ray, go ahead, please read. Yes, the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines presents the certificate of appreciation to attorney Edsel F. Tupas, senior partner, Goreseta, Africa, Cauton, and Saavedra, for being a speaker during the Ethics Chasing Technology webinar given on the 6th day of August, 2024. Signed, Wilma Miranda, Chairman, Ethics Committee, and Florencia Tariella, Liaison Director, Ethics Committee. <clears throat> Likewise, Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Ms. Jacqueline Villar, 
managing partner Corbis Mazars Philippines for being a reactor during the ethics chasing technology webinar giving on the 6th day of August 2024 signed Wilma Miranda chairman ethics committee Florencia Tariella liaison director ethics committee Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for EVP Joey for gracing our webinar today and um, giving the welcome remarks in behalf of our president. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, what's next, Ray? We do have a group pick. Indeed. So now may I ask all the participants to open their cameras for the group picture taking. Alex, uh, please take the pictures. The pictures. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. Please open your cameras. Uh, I suggest that uh, you smile through the process because we have lots of uh, attendees today and I can't fit uh, everyone in one shot. So we have three pages of uh, participants right. today. Okay, uh, I'll take the first page. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll take the second page. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay. Now I'll take the final page. One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much, Alex. Now, I would like to remind everyone as well to answer the evaluation form, which is uh, going to be posted in the chat box and submitted to Alex at alexis.canon at phoenix.org. You can also see his email address in the chat box. Okay. Now, then to formally also, then close... Ray, then we also have a QR code. Yes, indeed. Uh, so the QR code will be posted in the chat box as well. Thank you, Wilma. Thank you, Wilma. Now, to formally close this webinar, may I call on the sub-chair for School Symposium, Newspaper, Social Media, and Book Promotion, mm -hmm. Mr. Joseph Albert Gamoa. Thank you, Ray and Wilma. Uh, many thanks to our keynote speaker, Attorney Edsel Tupas, for your excellent presentation. I'm familiar with your top tier legal and technology firm, Goriseta Law, not only because um, your managing partner is our uh, Phoenix colleague, Attorney Mark, but also because your firm is the supplier of my company, the Asian Center for Legal Excellence, specifically the aptitude, the aptitude system that uh, Goriseta Law developed for our online MCLE classes approved by the Supreme Court. Thank you also to our panel reactor, attorney Jackie Villar, who's a fellow Phoenix member. It's actually, it's actually the first time I've heard of Mazars Philippines, but, but it's good to know, to know that 4 Mazars is a global network operating in more than 100 countries, which uh, your local practice joined in 2016. And finally, a big thanks to all our participants in this webinar on behalf of the Phoenix Ethics Committee. A pleasant afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much, Albert. And that formally ends this webinar. We hope that you had a great afternoon learning from our esteemed speaker and reactor. See you again in upcoming Phoenix events. Thank you and keep safe. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Alex, can you post the evaluation form link in the chat box? You're looking for it, aside from the QR code. Okay, bro.